Algorithms and Programs, Part 2. The first objective in this video is about searching. Now, in terms of this, we need to explain and apply a shortest path algorithm. The one we'll pick is Dijkstra's. We're going to use big O to determine the efficiency of linear and binary searches in terms of execution time and space requirements and to compare the efficiency of different types of search algorithms. We're going to follow search and sort algorithms and programs and make alterations to them and write search and sort algorithms and programs. So let's remind ourselves what we're talking about here. Well, first, the shortest path algorithms. If you go and watch the playlist on 4.2 data transmission, we cover the basis of this in much more detail. However, it doesn't cover Dijkstra's algorithm, which is what we'll talk about here today. On a very simplistic scale, what we'd need to do is work out the shortest path from each node to each other, and then compute back to work out what we need. Let's have a look at how this is done in algorithmic form with Dijkstra's algorithm. Now, what we need to do here is start at one location and work our way to the final location, identifying the vertices from each node and putting them in order of size. So for instance, if we start with node A, the vertices that connect from A are C and B. Now, C has a distance of two and B has a distance of five. So I'm gonna put them in the order C and B. And now I've completed that, there are no more vertices for me to explore from A, I can mark A as completed. Now, the only time we ever update the distance from A value in a completed node is if we find a vertice that has a shorter path to it. Let's move on to C then, we'll investigate that first. From C, we can go to A, but that's going back on ourselves. We can go to B, and that has a shorter distance of four, so we'd update that. And we can also go to D, which has a distance of six from A. So that's further away than B, so we'll put that further down in the list. Now notice we've updated B this time, because it was a shorter path in this direction. C is complete now, so we mark it as done and move on to our next closest node, which is B. Now you see that B can go back to C, but that's going to increase the, the length. It's going to go back to A, that's going to increase the length as well. But the two vertices that we can go to without going back on ourselves are E and D. Now you'll see there that D actually has a distance of 5 away from A, which is shorter than the distance we've already computed. So we replace that in the table. And we've also got E, which is a total distance of 8 away. With that vertice completed, we can cross that off, and we can look at E. Now, E has no vertices to travel in that we haven't already done, so we call that a day. And you can work out then what the route is by tracing our way back. If you look in the previous node, we can work our way backwards. So the way you write that is you'd put the distance to E is 6, where we go from A to C, then C to B, then B to D, then D to E. And that's the shortest path between those two nodes. Now, another algorithm that's used to find the shortest path is called A star. It is essentially Dijkstra's with a estimating value called a heuristic added to it, and it's far better and quicker for identifying the fastest route because it doesn't go back on itself. Uh, we won't cover that here, but it's worth a look if you are interested in this sort of thing. So searches then. Well, a linear search, we just go through each value from start to finish until it locates the item. The complexity of both here is, is linear. It increases in size in both space and time complexity as the data set increases. So for instance, if we have this data set here and we're looking for the element D, we start with element zero. It's not there, so we move on to one. It's not there, we move on to two, and it is. So we return the index two to the user. In the worst case of this, if D was not in it, we'd have to compare every single index of that array until we were 100% sure that it wasn't in there. And that's not the most efficient thing in the world. How about a binary search then? Well, a binary search is much better. It divides the list into two. It compares and discards the side it's not in and it repeats itself. It only works on an ordered list though. So the previous one would work on an unordered list. This one only works in one that's already been sorted. But because of that, it's logarithmic. The increase in time and space complexity as the size of n grows doesn't increase that much. In this example, we're looking for D in this data set. Now, the way that binary search works is it finds a midpoint. And you might be saying to me, well, this doesn't look like the midpoint because it's slightly to the left. Well, the midpoint in this data set would be between two items. So we either round down or round up, but we'll just be consistent with it. Now I'm rounding down. So I first of all say, is C equal to D? And it's not. 
So then my second question is, well, which side does D fall on? Is D less than on the left-hand side or greater than on the right-hand side? Well, it's greater than, isn't it? So that means we can dismiss and ignore the left-hand side completely. We've lost half of our data in our first run-through. Identify the midpoint again. Is that value the same as that one? It's not. So we ignore everything. We ignore that one. And we say, is D before or after that? Well, it's before. So we can ignore that and everything after it. Finally, we get to this last element. Are they the same? They are. And bear in mind, this was the worst case scenario. This was the scenario where we find it as the very last element. And it took three comparisons. Compare that to the previous example, and you'll see why it's so much faster and more efficient. Now, of course, you'll need to be able to read, write, edit, and discuss these algorithms as they're written in pseudocode. We look at that more in the activities and past paper questions because it gives us the opportunity to explore those in detail. The next objective in this unit is sorting. We need to explain the need for a variety of sorting algorithms, both recursive and non-recursive, describe the characteristics of sorting algorithms, including quicksort. We need to explain the effect of storage space requirements, number of comparisons of data items, number of exchanges needed and number of passes through the data on the efficiency of a sorting algorithm. And then finally, use our friend Big O to determine the efficiency of different sorting algorithms in terms of their time and their space requirements. We need to compare the efficiency of different sorting algorithms. And of course, Big O is the best way to do that. So let's start with why we need them. Well, different sorting algorithms have different characteristics which means they're better at sorting different kinds of data sets. So because of that, we may use sorting algorithms that have terrible big O complexity because we know that the data set going into them is the best case for that algorithm, and in which case it would work well with it. We do need both iterative and recursive algorithms, though, as they have different characteristics. You know, more memory requirements for recursion, certainly. So they have different applications on different types of devices. When we're talking about efficiency, what sort of things are we comparing? Well, we're starting with the storage space requirements, and that changes depending on whether it's iterative or recursive. We're also talking about the number of comparisons which require data reading, logical comparisons using the ALU, and the output that results. So if there are more of those, it increases the instructions and the time taken to perform the sort. The number of exchanges is also important because it can be high or low, and the higher it is, the more we need to write to the disk, and writing to the disk is slow and takes more time. It's also important to know how many numbers of passes through the data happens because if we keep going through the data set, that's going to impact on our big O complexity and will definitely increase their linear complexity. Bubble sort is the least efficient one in the group, and what happens is we just compare positions n and n plus 1 and swap if necessary, and we repeat it until we can get throughout our data set in a single pass without swapping anything. Now, it's got polynomial time complexity, which is not ideal because we will be repeating going through the data set from start to finish as many times as we need to. But it's got a constant space requirement. We don't need any more space to process this data. And let's take a look at it in action with this data set. So we start off with n being 0 and then n plus 1 being a. We compare the values and we decide, are they in the correct order? And if they're not, we swap them as we did here. We then increase the value of n, which moves n and n plus 1 on. And we look at these two values. Do they need to be swapped? They don't. These two don't, these two don't, but these two do. We've made it to the end of one pass, and we made at least one swap, which means the data set isn't complete. So we start again with n equals 0. Now I'm going to fast forward a little bit through this now just to make it a bit clearer what's happening. In our next pass, we'll swap b and e around. In the next pass, we'll swap b and d around. And the next pass, we'll swap b and c around, and we've got sorted data. And the reason we've gone a bit faster through that is because that makes it clear why it's called bubble sort. The data appears to bubble in the direction of the sort. Insertion sort, where we create a list of size 1. Now, a list of size 1, by its very nature, is sorted. And then what we do is add the unsorted list to the correct positions within the new list. It's got a time complexity, which is a polynomial, because we're going through the list multiple times, and a constant space complexity, because we don't need any more space. In this example, what we're going to do is we're going to pop off the first item and assume that's a sorted list. And then we're going to go through all the other items in our list and put them in the correct place. So notice A goes there, F goes to the right of the C, slot in the E, slot in the D, slot in the B. We've not said how to insert it. There's no detail really on how to insert it. That could be a simple 
linear search for where it goes if you wanted, which is why it's got polynomial time complexity, because we are going to be going through the data set multiple times. Merge sort is a bit nicer. We separate everything out into individual elements. We pair them up, sort them, and repeat. And this is reasonably straightforward. It's got a logarithmic time complexity, which is nice because it's a divide and conquer algorithm, but a linear space complexity. It doesn't need much more room than it's got. So what we do is split the data up, assuming that each one is its own sorted list. And then we pair them up. So we start with C and A over here. And what we do is we go through the left and right and say, OK, which one of those is the first item in the list? Well, it's going to be A, so we bring that down. And the second item in the list is going to be C. OK, that's a sorted pair. Let's have a look at F and E. E is first, then F. We've got a sorted pair. How about D and B? B is first, D is next. A sorted pair. Now, when they're sorted, we pair up those pairs. Now, we've got an odd number, so we'll just pair up the first two first. And we go through, starting at the first letter in each item, and we say E, A or E, which is first. So we get A. That comes down here. Now, C is the first thing in, in the left-hand set, and E is the first thing in the right-hand set. So we say, OK, which of those comes down first? Well, it's C. Now, at this point, there's nothing left in the one set, so we can bring that entire thing down. And we've got a sorted data set. Let's do the same thing when we merge these two. We're looking only at the first element of each set. We say, OK, A or B, A first. Then we're saying C or B, B first. Then we're saying C or D, C first. E or D, D first. And then we can bring the rest of them down. And we've got a sorted data set. Now, you can do that in memory space. So it doesn't require much more in terms of memory space than it originally had. Quick sort then is a bit more complicated, but is by its very name quick. We use the first element as a pivot point, and we move items to the left or the right depending on the size. We do not care about the sublists. And what we do is just repeat that for all sublists until it's sorted. This has once again got a logarithmic time complexity because it's a divide and conquer algorithm, and a logarithmic space complexity because it increases, but not by that much. So let's take this data set. We'll take the first item to be our pivot point. And all we're going to do is chuck the rest of the data down to the left or the right, depending on where it should sit in the list. We're not worried about sorting that data. So you'll see there that on the right hand side, F, E, D are in completely the wrong order. We don't care about that. Now, once we've used one as a pivot point and we've finished allocating the data, that position is locked. Then we've got two other sublists we need to use. So let's take the A and B first. We'll take A as our pivot point and we'll identify where B goes. It goes in the right. That goes back in and A is locked. Go for our second list. Take F as our pivot point. Now, E goes to the left, D goes to the left as well. It goes back up and our pivot point becomes locked in place. Identify B. Now, B is a set of one, which means it's already sorted. So we can just lock that where it is. We've got a set of two here. So we start with our pivot point E and we say D goes in front of that. It goes back up and E is locked. D is a set of one, which means it's already sorted and we lock that as it is. And we've got sorted data. I think quicksort is one of the nicest algorithms there is.